The title of my sermon this morning is Timeline of End Times. Now, I know end times is a topic that you could, you could spend weeks and weeks and weeks on. And we may spend a couple of weeks on end times because as I was just preparing for this sermon, I noticed that a lot of the events as you describe them really are just going through passages in Revelation. So um, I'm planning on maybe one, a couple of weeks, we'll actually go through, similar to how we went through the book of Hebrews, we'll go through a couple of chapters of Revelation every week and go through it over a couple of weeks. Because as you go through this, like I said, you just start really going through the passages in Revelation and rather than trying to cram it all into one sermon uh, we should do that over a couple of weeks and I know a lot of people are interested in this sort of topic. Now our church's position uh, when, we, when we refer to end times, what are we referring to? We're referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ and events that are going to happen prior to his coming and then he comes and what is going to happen after that. People know that, hey, there are these things that are going to happen, but they don't always know the order of events. And that's what I really want to focus more so on today, is the order of events that happen, as opposed to um, just going through in depth uh, of end times prophecy. Because what I find with end times prophecy is that a lot of, uh, when people are interested in end times prophecy, it's really just a lot of speculation. You know, they're speculating uh, like what this may mean in the Bible and what this may mean in the Bible and is this, this and that and, uh, you know, and exactly how is it going to turn out? Is it going to be a microchip and all these things? And, and this is where people really start to get into the, the occult and all these things that are happening, the new world order and stuff. So we know there's going to be a one world government. We know that the Antichrist will come and he's going to rule this one world government but where people tend to i think get a bit too in depth into it and where a lot of your time can be you know can go into this topic is just these these speculative ideas on what exactly and all the specifics of how it's going to play out now our church's position on end times is what would be known as post-tribulation pre-wrath now when people use these terms post-tribulation, pre-tribulation, what they're referring to is the timing of the rapture. This is when we are gathered to Jesus Christ. So our position in this church is it's post-tribulation. It happens after a period which is called the tribulation, but it happens before the period which is referred to as God's wrath, when God pours out his wrath on the earth. So not only are we post-trib, pre-wrath, we are pre-millennial. So you might have heard that uh, that uh, word thrown around when people refer to their end times position. What does that mean? Well, the millennial reign, the millennial kingdom is that thousand year reign of Christ on this earth. And some people believe that rapture happens you know, before the millennial, pre-millennial. Like some people think it's post-millennial. Some people believe that the thousand year reign of Christ is not actually literal. That this is just like a symbolic of something else. And they're called our millennial. So they don't even believe there is a millennial reign. So there are different positions when it comes to end times. But our position is that the rapture happens post-tribulation, so after the tribulation, pre-God's wrath, and it happens pre-millennial, before the thousand-year reign. So we are raptured, and then we go through that thousand-year reign of, of Christ. Now, just a bit of background um, on my position on end times. You know, end times... You know, you, you might be wondering, like, Victor, why have you never preached a sermon on end times? Like, the last time we heard about end times was, was, when, was when Kevin was here. And to be honest, you know, even though our church in, a, in, in the circles in Australia is known for our position because it's quite rare to have a position of post-tribulation, pre-wrath, I've never really taken a big interest in end times. And I remember I was talking with a preacher once and he was saying, oh, you know, Victor, you know, can you send me your dissertation and your essays on, you know, your position on end times? And I'm like, I don't think I've studied it out as much as you because, you know, whilst I have a position just through my own study, and that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today, I don't know all the intricacies of all the objections and all the arguments and all, you know, people get into Zionism and dispensationalism and all these things and, and all these different Old Testament passages. And the reason why it's never been a really big interest of mine personally is because I find it's just something that Christians discuss and there's nothing wrong with discuss. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with discussing end times at all, but it's just something that is a discussion amongst Christians. Right? So it's a discussion that Christians have, they disagree over, 
and unfortunately some Christians separate over. You know, they separate over this, this issue. But it's never been a big interest of mine because, number one, it's not a salvational issue. Right? So there are, there are some issues that are salvational and they really need to be defended. So that's why I spend a lot more time thinking about how to defend work salvation, how to defend you know, creationism versus evolution, um, how to defend uh, you know, uh, biblical morality, you know, like today with homosexuality so uh, pr prolific. Um, you know, we have the, the abortion issue as well. You know, people wondering, what, like, why does the Bible have the death penalty for these things? Why does the Bible have the death penalty for adultery? You always hear that. Oh, you know, the Bible's so, uh, so uh, what do they say? It's so uh, harsh or whatever. Uh, and they say, you know, you, that, that, that you should punish adultery with the death penalty. Well, there are reasons for that. And if we don't know the reasons for why God has instituted these sort of things, then we will, have, we will struggle defending the Bible and defending our faith. So I find it's not a salvation issue. It has, it has little apologetic value as well. And like I said, it's something that Christians mainly discuss over. And because I tend to engage more with unbelievers and people that are trying to uh, speak against the Bible, I haven't spent a lot of time, you know, amongst IFB circles trying to defend the post-tribulation rapture. And people that have, they're the ones that know all the intricacies of the argument, um, whereas I personally uh, don't know all of them. It's not that I'm completely ignorant on the information out there, but it, when it comes, you can, you can go deep into any topic, and this is not one topic I've really, really dived deep into. So whilst I have no issue with people studying this topic and having great interest in it, I think there are many other topics that have more apologetic value in the current world that we live in and I think would be more of value to us to have knowledge in, to actually defend the faith from those attacking the faith uh, rather than spending too much time uh, just attack brethren attacking each other over an issue that is non-salvational. So like I said, it doesn't mean that it's not important. I think it's something that we have to learn. Just giving you some background on why I haven't spent a lot of time on it. Because why, what is important? If it's not, if, if it's not important in regards to salvation, I'm not saying it's not important at all, where does your position on end times, what is important about it? What does it change? Well, what it will change, it, it will change whether you expect to go through the tribulation period, right? Because some people believe that before the tribulation period even starts, what is the tribulation period? It's when it, there's tough times coming to Christians. It's when the world, there's going to be an added persecution to Christians. Why? Because Satan now is driving this even harder because he knows he has not much time left. Now, if you know you're going to go through that tribulation period, you're going to be more prepared for it if we happen to be the generation that goes through it. But if you have the mindset of, well, we're going to be out of here when times get tough. When times start getting tough, you're going to get a rude awakening when that happens. So it's good to know if you are to go through the tribulation period, that you know what's going to happen and how it's going to play out so that you're ready, like we read in Matthew 24, that you're watching that you're prepared. But if you think that when the tribulation starts, you're just going to be gone, you're going to get the easy ticket out of here, well, then you're not going to be ready when it happens and, um, and things like that. Also, it's going to change your view on what you do about how bad the world is getting. Because when people have a pre-tribulation rapture view, they think, well, I don't, it doesn't really matter how bad the world's getting because when it gets bad, guess what? I'm going to be gone. Right? I'm going to be out of here. And they tend to get this mindset of like, well, it doesn't matter how bad the world gets because they're not going to be around. But if you're going to be around when the world starts getting bad, you may want to do something about the world, the, the acceleration of the de decrease of the world because you may actually help accelerate it rather than decelerate it. Because we don't know, like Matthew 24 says, exactly when it's going to happen at this point in time. And I will address that uh, issue a little bit later. Now, the last thing it changes and why it's important is, is it changes how you think the current day Israel should be viewed politically. So, this is, so if you wonder, like, why do people fight over it and why is it so important? Well, because the end times events are, are very intrinsically linked to people's view 
on dispensationalism, which is like hey, the difference in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but also their view on who Israel really is, who's the true Israel, and how Israel should be treated. So if you're what's called like a Zionist and you think like the modern day Israel today is the Israel that's being talked about in the Old Testament, that's why you, you wonder like why are countries, when why are the presidential campaigns in US, they go, you know what, and we are a friend of Israel. Why is that? It's because of their position on end times and Zionism and who they think the true Israel is. They think the current Israel today is the true Israel and that's why we should be blessing them and sending them money uh, and if you have a wrong understanding of that, then you end up blessing and sending money to a bunch of Christ-rejecting, anti-Christ Jews that have currently set up this nation called Israel. But if you know what the Bible teaches about the true Israel, and that's believers, then you'll understand the blessings and the promises are to the believing nation, the true spiritual Israel, not this false physical Israel that has been set up by the United Nations and all that sort of stuff. So it's all that sort of stuff that people start to get into when, when they talk about end times prophecy and all that sort of stuff. And that's not, all the, that's not the stuff I want to talk to about today. I just want to look at what the Bible teaches about these, this timeline of end times events. What are the things that are going to happen leading up to the coming of Jesus Christ and then what happens after he returns and all, unto all eternity? Now, one other thing I just want to address before I get into the sermon is some people wonder how like, my views were formed on this topic because I'm sure a lot of people think that the reason why I am uh, post-tribulation pre-wrath is because I learned it from a preacher called Stephen Anderson. And a lot of you guys are familiar with Stephen Anderson in this room, but this is not actually the case. I was actually post-tribulation pre-wrath rapture before I actually came across uh, the preaching of Stephen Anderson, uh, which I, I don't, obviously I don't follow him anymore. But see, before that, I was a uh, pre-tribulation rapture, just because that's what I was taught. You know, I was in a Bible Presbyterian church. Um, Presbyterians are traditionally post-tribulation rapture, because pre-tribulation rapture is quite a new doctrine in terms of it's only existed for a couple of hundred years. But because the Bible Presbyterians were a break-off of the Presbyterians, they had a more modern view on end times prophecy. So they were pre-tribulation, pre-millennial. So that's what, what I was taught when I went to the first church that I went to. And it really, like, even back then, it wasn't a big deal to me either. Because I knew, you know, these are, what happens in the future is not so important as in what's happening now, like what we can affect now in the world. But, you know, as you do when you're growing in the faith, you know, you're reading your Bible, you're looking up sermons on the internet, and you're looking up all different things. And, and, um, and like I always warn you guys, you know, you've got to first read your Bible and get familiar with your Bible before you start listening to too many preachers out there. Why? Because when you listen to so many people out there, how do you discern whether what you're listening to is even right if you have no good grounding on the Bible yourself? And you feel like you're listening to sermon after sermon and you think, man, you're learning all this good stuff, right? You feel like you're learning the Bible, but how do you even know that what they're teaching is right? So that's why to have the right foundation for your spiritual life, you need to get in the Bible first. Read that. That, that should be the main portion of your diet. And it should be supplement. You've got to think of sermons, even Sunday morning, even my preaching, sermons you listen to on the internet or sermons that you download through podcasts. You've got to think of those as supplements, supplements to your spiritual life. But if they become your mainstay, then you know, you're, not, you're not actually going to be healthy even though you may feel healthy because you're going to be nutritionally deficient because you're not going to be able to feed yourself and have a good stable diet. So anyways, as you do, you're listening to sermons, you're looking up sermons. I came across this sermon and the title was The Myth of the Pre-Tribulation Rapture. And I was just like, the myth of the Pre-Tribulation Rapture? Like, what? Like, people have different views on this? And I listened to this sermon and this sermon was basically just addressing some of the common verses used to support the Pre-Tribulation Rapture. And he just went, through, went to that passage in the Bible because remember, I was at a point in time where I, I wasn't really reading through my Bible yet. I'd, know, I'd heard these passages preached in church, you know, the moment of twinkling of an eye, you hear these things, right? No man knoweth the day or the hour. So he would go to these sort of verses and just show, like, look, this actually doesn't say anything about 
the timeline of events. And in fact, in Matthew 24, no man knoweth the day or the hour, like we read in that chapter, we're told that the gathering happens after the tribulation. So it was things like that that just struck out at me. And I was like, how are people believing the pre-tribulation rapture when, a, when just a readover of Matthew 24 clearly teaches us that God's elect are going to be gathered after the tribulation? You know, that there's this tribulation that was like never before. So how can this not be the tribulation that people refer to when they talk about the rapture? This is this main tribulation. And then it says immediately after the tribulation of those days, then we are gathered together. So it was at that point where I'm like, well, that makes complete sense to me that the rapture happens after the tribulation. So that's, that was pretty much the extent of when I changed my views. I was like, oh, interesting. It looks like it's post-trib. But I didn't think at the time it was a really big deal. I just thought, okay, well, people have different views on these events. What's the big deal? And then I realized, wow, like people are like, you know, Bible-believing Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, will separate over this issue. And in fact, even somebody I know, right, does, there, there, are many people, there are many churches like ours that do not want to associate with another church just because of their view on end times prophecy. And I find that very sad. Anyway, let's get into the sermon. So I've got seven points to go through. <clears throat> and uh, just going through the different sort of chapters or different, different times of events. So we'll go through what would happen today. If you died today, because Jesus obviously has not come back yet, right? what would happen today if you died? Where would you go? So today, if you died, in this period of time where Jesus has already come once, right? he's come and he's died as the sacrifice, and he has ascended to heaven, and we're waiting for his second coming. If you were to die right now, where would you go? Well, let's look at Luke 16, verse 19. It says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dog came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So if somebody was to die right now, if they are saved, if they have put their faith on Jesus Christ, they would immediately be with the Lord Jesus. We, say, we see here in Luke 16 that Lazarus, who is representing the saved person here in this story, he is carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now I just underline this because some people believe that Abraham's bosom is a location as opposed to a person's body part. And there's this, all this stuff about dispensationalism as well, and there's this, there's, this other, there's this other compartment in the earth that doesn't have any fire, that's called paradise. It's also referred to as Abraham's bosom. This is where you get the word Abraham's bosom from and where they call that section Abraham's bosom. I don't believe that at all. And I don't even know how you can call that location Abraham's bosom when it's obvious in this passage, when he's carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, we see here, he lifts up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So obviously it's not referring to a location. It's actually Lazarus being you know, embraced by Abraham. So how people make that out to a location, I'm not sure. When the next verse over tells you Abraham is actually there, and Lazarus is actually in the bosom being embraced, by him. But here we see immediately where the beggar dies, he goes to heaven. Immediately when the rich man dies, and he's representing the unbeliever here. So it's not necessary that if you're poor, you go to heaven, you're rich, you go to hell. It's just this is the story with two people being represented here because it's more likely that people that are poor go to heaven just because they're more humble. That's why Jesus said, How hardly shall they that trust in riches enter into the kingdom of heaven? It's not that it's a sin to be rich or it's hard for people uh, that rich people can't go to heaven. It's that rich people tend to trust more in themselves. And that's why in Australia, even though we may not in this room all be filthy rich, I mean, we are rich compared to you know, 80% of the world's population. And that's why when you go down the street, you talk to people about spiritual things, do they care? No, because according to the Bible, I mean, we are rich, and how hardly shall they that trust in riches enter into the kingdom of heaven. So if we were to die right now, 
That's how it works. If you're not saved, which means you do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you would immediately be in hell. You can see here that he, was, he, was di he died, he was buried, and the next moment in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So that's what would happen if you were to die right now. A believer goes immediately to heaven, an unbeliever goes directly to hell, and that's where they stay until later on where we'll look at the end times events. Now, why do I address this? Because some people believe in something called soul sleep. Soul sleep is that you do not immediately go to heaven as a believer. And generally, people that believe in soul sleep don't believe in an eternal hell either. They just believe that once you go to hell, you're just annihilated, right? But I want to show you that in the Bible, there, there isn't this concept of soul sleep. So soul sleep is you die and you, your soul is sleeping until the resurrection when Jesus comes back and then you will rise up out of your body as opposed to being in heaven immediately. Now, why do we believe that the moment you die, you are with the Lord? Well, look at 2 Corinthians 5. This is one passage. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So you see the two situations there? You're either at home in your body or if you're absent from your body, you are with the Lord. You're absent from the Lord of your home in, in the body. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. See, why, if Paul believed in soul sleep, why would he be more willing to be absent from his body and then just to be sleeping in the ground in his body for who knows how long until Jesus returns? Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, well, those are the two choices. We are either absent from the Lord right now because the Lord's in heaven, we're at home in the body, or we are present with him when we're absent from the body. We may be accepted of him. Philippians 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So what is the gain that you get when, when you die? Because if you die and you're just in the ground, you don't gain anything yet until later on, until you resurrect. But the reason why he says to die is gain, for if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. What is he saying? I've got these two options. One is to live in the flesh, the other to die. And he's saying, which one do I actually prefer? For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, and look at this, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So you see there the difference. You're either at home in the body or he has a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Luke 23. Luke 23, just want to, is still on? I think these, uh, see these air conditioners like just turn off after a certain time. And when we have more people, it gets a bit hotter in here, a bit quicker. It's great. So when I start feeling hot up here, I was just wondering how you guys feel out there. Okay, look at what he says here in Luke 23. This is the thief on the cross. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So if Jesus believed in soul sleep, why would he say to the thief on the cross, Today you'll be with me in paradise? Well, no, because the day he died, he would be with his body if he was soul sleeping. But no, Jesus says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, because the moment you die, if you're a believer, like one of these thieves on the cross was, then you go immediately to heaven. So that's what would happen today if somebody died. If somebody died, they would either they would go immediately to heaven or they'd go immediately to hell. If you obviously are alive up until the coming of our Lord Jesus, then you would see the tribulation period. So that's what we're going to go to next. So that's today. The second one is the tribulation period, which is when a certain time starts and Matthew 24 is explaining it, the signs of this time starting up until Jesus Christ actually appears and returns. So this is what we saw in Matthew 24. Now if we're talking about a timeline of events, of the time things are going to happen, somebody might say, well you can't 
know the timeline of events because in Matthew 24 it says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And this is where people get this idea that Jesus can come back at any time. Right? And you've probably heard that in church, or you've heard that before, where people are saying, Oh, you know, even before I finish preaching this sermon, Jesus might just come and, you know, who's going to be left behind? Some of us are going to disappear. And this is partly where they get this idea. It's like we don't know the day or the hour when this is going to happen. But the thing is, what chapter is this in? But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels, but my Father only. This is in Matthew 24, that chapter that we just read where Jesus is saying this is going to happen, then this is going to happen, these are the signs you're going to see, and then the Son of Man's going to come. So it's not that we're never going to know the day or the hour. It's just that now at this time when he's saying this, nobody knows the day or the hour because we don't know when this period is going to start. But when the period does start and we're watching and we're seeing the things, like he said, when you see the abomination of desol desolation stand in the holy place, you see these things come to pass, you're going to know that the time is near. Yeah, you may not know the exact day or the hour, but when these things start happening, you're going to have a rough idea when these things are going to start. Now look at Thessalonians 2. This is this idea that people say that Jesus can come back at any time. When we look at 2 Thessalonians 2, look what it says here. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So this is Paul now addressing the second coming of Jesus and the fact that we are going to be gathered together when he comes. He says, That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. What he's saying? What is he saying here? I don't want anyone to trouble you either by a word that you've heard or a teaching that you've heard or an, a letter as though it came from the apostles. What, uh, what is he worried you're going to be troubled by? As that the day of Christ is at hand. So what is he saying here when he says the day of Christ is at hand? Think about when they were preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? That it's right upon us. Right, I can come at any time. It's right here now. So is he saying, if anyone's saying that, don't be troubled. Why? Let no man deceive you by any means. Don't be deceived by somebody saying you, Christ, can come back at any moment. It's at hand. Why? Because there are certain things that have to happen first before Jesus returns. For that day shall not come. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So we know one thing definitely that's going to happen before Jesus Christ returns, and that's that the Antichrist will be revealed. And for those of us who are awake and watching, I think it's going to be very obvious when one man rises to rule a government that is overarching the entire world. When you see the world being ruled by one government and then one man rises to lead that government, that is going to be the Antichrist. Who opposeth and exalteth himself. Um, uh, who opposeth and, and, and exalteth himself. That's where I've got it here. So, and it goes on to talk about you know, how this Antichrist is going to be. He's basically going to pretend to be Jesus Christ uh, and whatnot. So I haven't included the other verses uh, in Second, Second Thessalonians. Now, as we go through Matthew 24, we're just going to go through the verses from about 3 to 31. You'll notice how similar the events that are laid out are with Revelation chapter 6. So we're going to compare these side by side, and you'll see Revelation chapter 6 is when the seals of the book begin to be opened. And if you compare Revelation chapter 6 with Matthew 24, you see these events side by side start to happen. Now Matthew 24, says, As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? So this passage in Matthew 24 is, is often called the Olivet Discourse, and that's just a fancy word for a discourse is just an extended teaching of Jesus. There's five in the book of Matthew, and this is one that was done on the Mount of Olives. You remember when we read 
Matthew 24. He was on the Mount of Olives giving this teaching. So that's why scholars will refer to this as the Olivet Discourse. It's the discourse that happened on the Mount of Olives. We see there, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. So now they're asking him, so the theme of this discourse was end times, because the disciples have asked him, hey, what are the signs of your coming? And what are the signs of the end of the world? And this is why Jesus goes into depth about, hey, the things that are going to occur leading up to him coming back. Now, if it could just happen at any moment, then there are no events leading up to this. So the fact that there are events leading up to it tells us, hey, there is some preparation that occurs before Jesus Christ returns. And as we read alongside in Revelation 6, you'll see how it's very similar. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So not only will there be one Antichrist who rules and reigns this one world government, there's going to be an increase of many people pretending to be Jesus Christ. And there's already people like that out there today. You know, it always boggles my mind today when you look up on YouTube and there's some new guy in some country somewhere pretending to be Jesus, you know, and saying he's now the reincarnation of Jesus and he's always got long hair, he's wearing white, because he's got to play the part, right, that Hollywood have made Jesus out to be, like as though Jesus, you know, has long hair and walks around in a white robe. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So we go to Revelation 6. Revelation 6 is where you start seeing the seals of this book open, leading up to the rapture and the gathering of God's people. He says, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, a, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown and was given unto him, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So what is this? This is the re revelation or the revealing of the Antichrist. Right? The power is given to him by who? By Satan. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Right? Because people are not just always going to willy-nilly give up their power to the Antichrist. People are going to be resisting. And that's why there's going to be this time of tribulation while the Antichrist is trying to control everyone. It's not only going to be Christians persecuted, even though Christians will be persecuted, unbelievers who are trying to resist this government as well will be persecuted too. That's why when you look into end times prophecy, you look into to these things, it's not only Christians that are interested in this stuff, it's other people, like atheists as well, unbelievers. They know that there's a new world order coming and a one world government. They're going to be resisting too. So not only will the Antichrist be conquering over believers, he'll be conquering over unbelievers as well, trying to set up this one world government. Matthew 24, And ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So notice here that Jesus says there's going to be wars and rumours of wars. Look in Revelation 6. And when he had opened the second seal, right? so there are all these seals on this book. Uh, and we might go over that when we go to Revelation. He opened the second seal. I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. So remember the first horse was what? It was a white horse. And why is that a white horse? Because the Antichrist is pretending to be Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus comes, he's going to be on a white horse. So the second seal is what? A horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon. So the power is on the person sitting on the horse. So the color, remember, is not of the horse man. The color is of the horse, and there's somebody on the horse representing what is going to happen at this time. They're on to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and that there was given unto him a great sword. So you see how that lines up. The first seal lines up with the Antichrist being revealed, right? The, the tribulation starting. The second seal lines up with the wars and the rumors of wars that Jesus mentioned. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places, and these are the beginning of sorrows. Then uh, shall there... Um, uh, and then we go on to verse 9. But what I wanted to stop here was in verse 7. So not only did we see the wars 
and rumours of wars where they'll kill one another and they shall be given unto him a great sword. Then we see the famines, the pestilences, the earthquakes and in diverse places. So here we see, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of uh, barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the wine and the oil. So what is the third seal? The third seal is a black horse and the person that sat on him. And we notice here Jesus mentions famines that are going to happen. So we see it, that lines up with the black horse that is coming because what's happening here? He says, Come and see, I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. So what does a balance normally represent? It's representing trade, isn't it? So the balance represents the trade that's going on. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, a measure of wheat for a penny. Now you may be thinking, wait, wait, if a measure of wheat only costs one penny, isn't that really cheap? How is that a famine? No, because a penny in the Bible is a day's wages. If you remember when Jesus' parable of the husbandman that he went and got and he, he agreed with them for a penny a day to work in his vineyard. So this is actually saying when you work for a day, you only get a measure of wheat. And if you wanted to get three measures of barley, that would cost you a day's wages. And they're saying, hey, don't hurt the oil and the wine. Why? Because it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's scarce at the moment. Why? Because there are famines going on. So you can see the black horse lines up with the famines that are mentioned in Matthew 24. Food being really expensive and scarce. Now, not only in Matthew 24 is famines mentioned, but we see the pestilences, the earthquakes in diverse places. So we see in Revelation 6, verse 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. I always think it's funny that you can be killed with death. <laughs> so I remember my, uh, my stepmom used to always say in Chinese, I'm going to kill you to death in Chinese. And it always reminds me of this passage that um, this pale horse, people are going to die. And what are they going to be killed with? They're going to be killed with the sword and with hunger and with death. But I think the reason why the Bible uses this, these words is if you think of a pale horse, you think of something that is sick. And that's why I believe the pale horse represents when you're being killed with death, it's actually the pestilences and the earthquakes that are killing people at this time. So that lines up with the fourth seal and the fourth horse that we see, this pale horse, come along. Now let's continue. Uh, these are the beginning of sorrows. So this is where we are mentioning this tribulation period. There's this period of sorrow or this time of trouble that is beginning and it starts with wars, rumours of wars, famines, pestilences and, um, tr and, and, and uh, persecution to not only believers but unbelievers because of this antichrist character that has come to rule and to reign on this earth. All these are the beginning of sorrows then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. So here is when we see the fifth seal opened up in Revelation 6. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So notice that it's lining up perfectly. The wars, the rumors of wars, the famines, the pestilences, the persecution, these are all mentioned as these seals are being opened in Revelation chapter 6. Slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and also their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So what is going to happen? We're going to see these signs come to pass. Increased 
persecution. People are going to start being martyred for their faith. But you, you see there that Jesus says, hey, many are going to be offended and they shall betray one another and hate one another. And that's a sad thing that not every, even believers are going to be able to take this persecution well and they're going to start turning each other in and turning on each other. This is what this tribulation period is going to be like. And like I said in the beginning, if you know that one day this period is coming, you can prepare yourself for it, at least mentally, spiritually, and whatnot. But if you don't know that it's coming, and it's going to be a vast majority of Christianity, this is why people are going to be betraying one another, because they're going to be thinking, well, you know, why is all this persecution happening? Aren't we meant to be gone? Aren't we meant to be raptured? This must not be the Antichrist. This must not be the persecution that we're going through, because we should be gone by now. So you can see how it changes how people will prepare themselves for this time. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And we know that this time there's going to be a lot of ungodliness happening. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now this passage in Matthew 24, now that we're going through it, you know that the context of this passage is end times events. So when the Bible says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, is it talking about work salvation? Because a lot of people use this passage to prove, well, this is why you've got to stay in church and you've got to you know, be faithful, you've got to be soul winning and reading your Bible and only if you do it up to the end of your life, then will you be saved. Well, is that the context of this passage? No. This passage is talking about the end times events. And what is it talking about? It's, and we'll see even later when Jesus refers to it. It's, a, it's saying that you're going through this tribulation period. People are getting killed. People are being martyred. But if you can go through this period and survive, if you can endure to the end of this period, then you'll be saved. By what? By the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come now what is this referring to some people think it refers to um, us preaching the preaching the gospel i think that's right as well but not only is it dependent on us because you know not everyone may get to every corner of the world but you see in revelation 14 we're told about an angel that is flying through the through the air and i saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So you see here that there will be this supernatural event where this angel is in the sky preaching the everlasting kingdom to everyone all over the world. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place Whoso readeth, let him understand. So what is Jesus referring to here? Well, in Daniel chapter 11, or in the book of Daniel, there is this statue that is referred to, that is going to be set up in the holy place, in the, in the temple. Because the temple is going to be rebuilt, the, the sacrifices are going to be instituted again during this end times, and there's going to be a day when this abomination of desolation, this idol, is put in the temple and, and people are commanded to worship it. And what Jesus is saying here, this tribulation period has already started, these things are happening in the tribulation period, but there's going to come a day in that tribulation period where you will see this event take place. And what is the significance of this event taking place? This is when the tribulation and persecution that is happening in the world just goes it goes up exponentially right and this happens at the very end of this tribulation period there is this time of great tribulation and you know it happens when you see this abomination of desolation put in the temple and this is why jesus says later on that we need to flee this is when you actually need to get out of there and get out because it's there's going to be nowhere to hide and you just have to make a run for it Daniel 11, look, an arm shall stand on, on this part, on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice 
and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. So you see how Jesus is referring to this scripture in Daniel, where Daniel, when you read the book of Daniel, prophesies a lot about things that are going to happen in the end times. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them which give suck in those days. So why is it? Because in the time of tribulation, you may still be able to exist, although somewhat hard, where you are. Because sometimes, where, where I picture this is, you know, there may be pockets of tribulation happening in different areas of the city. But, you know, people live in rural towns and whatnot, and maybe they're not so much affected by this overreaching government that is trying to stamp out Christianity and trying to get everyone to worship the beast and worship the Antichrist. So, but when you see the abomination of desolation put in the temple, that's when the persecution is going to grow exponentially and people are going to have to make a run for the hills. And this is why it's saying here, you've got to flee to the mountains and get out of there. And he's saying here, why is it woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days? Because obviously traveling distances on foot is going to be very difficult when you're pregnant or when, you're, when you're, you have a very young child because you may have to hide in those days. And obviously it's difficult to get very, very young children to stay quiet and whatnot. And that's why it's saying, hey, woe unto people that have children that are very young in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. I don't know necessarily the significance of the Sabbath day here. It may be because it's very hard to travel because nobody's allowed to, to work and things, a lot of things are closed and what, I don't know. But what I find interesting about verse 20 is that Jesus says, pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So it's interesting that if we ever go through this period, we see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place and we have to flee. Whether or not you ask when you have to flee may change the actual weather of when you have to flee, right? Because if you flee and you, it doesn't matter, you know, like you have no control over the weather, why would Jesus say, well then pray to God that you are actually going to flee and the weather's going to be good and it doesn't fall on a Saturday. So that's something for us to pray for when we are going through this period. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, look at this, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So what are they shortened by? Well, we're about to get into the coming of Jesus Christ now. So when, you, when he said before, he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved, what was he referring to? Well, he was referring to your actual physical life, right? Not being killed because now that this tribulation, tribulation um, gets even worse, it's already starting but when the abomination of desolation is placed in the holy place, it gets so bad that if the days were too long, anybody that disagrees with the, uh, with the Antichrist at this point will be killed. So he's saying the only reason why flesh, people are saved during this time is because Jesus returns. Jesus shortens those days and people are saved from physical death who have not died already. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So just a thought here. I remember talking to my wife when she used to be a Mormon. And you know, the Mormons believe that Jesus secretly appeared in the Americas and you know, things like that. A lot of people think Jesus has already come back. And I remember reading through Matthew 24 with her and saying, you know, like if you had read the Bible, because you're telling me the Book of Mormon lines up with the Bible, and the Book of Mormon says that Jesus returned in the, in the Americas, if you had read the Bible, you would have read this passage and known that when Jesus returns, he's warning about people coming and claiming to be Jesus, right? And these people, they're even going to come. What's interesting here? 
people are going to come and they're going to show great signs and wonders. That's why you don't want to just believe somebody just because they perform miracles. You know, even false prophets perform miracles. Even these false Christs are going to come and they're going to do miracles. They're going to show great signs and wonders. And if somebody is of the mindset, oh, well, this person does miracles, they must be of God, well, they may end up following a false Christ and a false prophet. So you, you can tell they're false Christ and false prophet. Why? Because they're getting you to worship the Antichrist. They're getting you to believe in a work salvation. Now, saved people will not be deceived by these, false, these signs and wonders from these false Christs. Because it says here, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it what not. So what is he saying? If somebody tells you that Jesus Christ has returned and it's some secret, you can just rule that out as false. Why? Verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What is he saying here? That when Jesus Christ returns, it's going to be like a lightning flash in the sky. Everyone's going to see that, just like they see the light from that lightning in the sky. When Jesus Christ returns, everybody will see him. Every eye shall see him. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now, I've always wondered what this this means. I don't know if you've ever wondered what it means. I'm not entirely sure, but what I think it means is he's obviously using the analogy of where a dead body is. Where a dead body is, that's where eagles gather to feast on that body. And I think that analogy is being used is because where Jesus, because Jesus is going to return bodily. And I think what he's talking about here is now he's talking about the gathering to him. So just like eagles gather to where a carcass is, we are going to gather to where Jesus returns, right? Which is where his body is. That's what I believe it's referring to. Now we get to Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Now, notice how this lines up with Revelation 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell. So notice how it lines up exactly. So Matthew 24 is an exact parallel with the events happening in Revelation 6. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. So this is where we can see that it's so obvious that the tribulation is happening first, right? People are being killed, people are being persecuted, and then the Son of Man appears, which lines up exactly with Revelation chapter 6. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens. So this is all the tribes of the earth. Hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him, that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So you see how notice all these events pass, and then Jesus comes. And this is why all the tribes of the earth are mourning. Why? Because Jesus Christ now has returned, and he is going to pour his wrath out on the earth. Now, how long, that's, that's what we're going to look at in Matthew 24, how long is this period? So we notice as we look through Matthew 24, we see the wars, the rumours of wars, as the seals are opening, we saw the, the white horse, the Antichrist, 
the, uh, the, the red horse with the wars and rumours of wars, the black horse which was the famines, the pale horse which is the, the pestilences, the earthquakes. Then Jesus says the abomination of desolation is going to be put in the holy place. Persecution is going to rise exponentially where people are going to be on there. They're going to be on foot now. They're going to be fleeing in order to save their lives. And then the Son of Man appears in heaven. And it's not going to be a secret. He's not going to be in the desert where you have to go find him. Everyone's going to look up. Every eye shall see him and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. Now, what is the period of time from when the tribulation starts to when Jesus Christ comes? Now, you always hear this timeline thrown out there, three and a half years. Three and a half years from the time it starts to when the time Jesus comes. Now, why is that? Well, in Revelation 12, there's a few passages that allude to this three and a half year period. Revelation 12, chapter, chapter 6, and the woman fled into the wilderness. So this is what I believe is talking about the, the persecution that's going on um, in Revelation 12 during the tribulation, and people are fleeing to get away from this persecution. This woman in Revelation represents, you know, believers fleeing from this persecution where she had the place prepared of God, and they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, if you divide one thousand two hundred and three score, which is sixty days, by thirty days, because a month in the Bible is thirty days, that's when you get forty-two months. If you divide that by twelve months, that's where you get the th this three and a half year period. So this is why myself you may you may hear people oh you know when they're preparing for the tribulation right they're preparing and they're going to like store off all their cans and everything like that and we're going to learn how to can and got to learn out all this stuff you're not going to be able to bunker down in the tribulation why because if the government wants to take your house and take your store of food i mean how are you going to stop them we're going to be on the move and this is why i think in matthew 10 Jesus talks about going from city to city or going into the wilderness. But what I believe about this time, look at what it says here, where she hath, where she hath a place prepared of God. I don't think necessarily we have to worry so much about how we're going to provide for ourselves because I think we're going to be supernaturally provided for. God's going to help us provide for us. Now, is it useful? And this is something that you know, Lewis and I have talked about. Would it be useful to, to have some, some skills in terms of how to survive in the wilderness? Yeah, of course. Because just like, you know, we have a responsibility, you know, like if you think about a job, we have a responsibility to go find a job, but God ultimately provides us a job. I think if we go out prepared, watching, God is going to provide us sources of food and things like that out there. So we're going to be on the run. We're going to be on the move, but we may be going from city to city, staying somewhere, but when the tribulation goes really bad after the abomination of desolation, this is where you may not even be able to stay in a place. You've got to run for the hills and just get out of there. But we will be provided for supernaturally. That's what I believe. And this period lasts 1,200 and three score days. This is how we know it's going to be three and a half years. And this time is alluded to from um, uh, in, in, in Revelation and in other places. But I think the reason why you don't know the exact day or the hour, because you don't really know when this tribulation period starts. Because, you know, when the Antichrist is revealed, I'm sure he's revealed over a certain period of time, he may have been revealed, and then when is he actually announced? as this one ruler is that when the three and a half year period starts so this is why even though we know it's approximately three and a half years we don't know exactly when it starts and when it's going to stop but when we see the abomination of desolation that's when you know it's very close jesus is going to come here very soon because unless he comes everybody who disagrees with the antichrist is going to get wiped out so that's Revelation 12, 6. Revelation 12, 14. Look again as we look further down. To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time. Look at this. And times, right? Time, times, and half a time. So again, alluding to that three and a half year period from the face of the serpent. Revelation 13. And there was given unto him, this is talking about the Antichrist, 
given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him, look at this, to continue 40 and 2 months. What is 40 and 2 months? Three and a half years. Right? You divide that by 12, which is 1260 days. And the last passage that refers to this three and a half year period is people tend to know this, this, uh, this period of end times as Daniel's 70th week. Because why? Because in Daniel when you read there's this seven week period and then this 62 week period and then this last week, this 70th week, it's kind of describing these last days. And he shall come, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And look at this. And in the midst of the week, so notice that a week is seven days, but in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, right? the abomination of desola desolation, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So notice how this end times period from when the tribulation starts to later on when we talk about the wrath is referred to as a week and in the midst of the week it's, it's referring to this abomination of desolation that sets up and that's very close to when Jesus returns and that's why there's that three and a half year period. Okay, so once this tribulation period starts, this is the most time we're going to spend in Matthew 24. The rest of the points are a lot quicker. Now we get to the rapture. So what is the rapture? The rapture is this gathering unto Jesus Christ. This is what people call that event. So some people call it the second coming. Some people call it the gathering. But mostly what it's referred to as the rapture. And this is why people will ask you, when do you believe the rapture happens? Is it pre-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture and whatnot? So up until this time, all these signs are happening. We see the abomination of desolation. Then when Jesus returns, this is when the rapture happens. Matthew 24, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and thou shalt gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So this is how we are saved from the tribulation. People are actually physically taken away from the location and gathered up to heaven where Jesus Christ appears. Now what is the significance of Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 going along side by side? Well, because it's not until Revelation 7 that we see this rapture take place. Look, Revelation 7 verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white, robes and palms in their hands jump down to verse 13 and one of the elders answered saying unto me what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they and i said unto him sir thou knowest and he said to me these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb so this just proves that the rapture occurs after the tribulation because not only in matthew 24 when we see the events happening jesus mentions the rapture rapture happens after in revelation 7 which is an event happening after the seals are opened that's when the rapture happens and this great multitude appears in heaven of all nations and kindreds and tongues so how does this rapture happen if we are physically on the earth and we go through this tribulation period, right? the great tribulation happens, we're on the run, eventually we look up, Jesus has now appeared and he saves us, we will be caught up into the air. Now in 1 Thessalonians 4, it gives us a bit more of a description about what happens. 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the first people to be caught up are those believers who their bodies are now in the ground because we've, we've been buried. They will be reunited with their bodies already because they're already with Jesus in the air, right, in heaven. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So when the rapture happens, 
those the bodies of those that are dead in Christ rise first and as they are pulled up then we are pulled up with them to meet the Lord in the air now when the Lord returns he doesn't come straight to earth right when he returns he's going to be in the air right and we're going to be gathered to him up into the air I'll just skip over 1 Corinthians 15 for now, but that's another passage on us being brought up. So what happens after we are gathered, right? The tribulation happens, we're gathered, we're caught up to be with Jesus in the air. Now what happens? Now the wrath of God gets poured out onto the earth. And I won't spend too much time in here, but you can read through Revelation 8, to 11 or you can read through revelation 15 to 19 and it gives a really in-depth description of either the trumpet judgments and the vials that are poured out on the earth and this is basically god pouring out his anger on the unbelieving world and this is what we are spared from as well so not only are we saved from tribulation but we are taken out of the earth because for the next three and a half years God's wrath is being poured out on the earth and people are being killed, people are being tormented on the earth and whatnot for refusing to believe and accept the grace of God. Revelation 11. Now, how long does this period last? In Revelation, uh, in this, this wrath period. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise, measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under their foot 40 and two months so again that's that 40 and two months period so this is after we have taken out remember in revelation 7 this is now the end uh, talking about of god's wrath and things that are happening during this period this is when there are two witnesses that are preaching the gospel through this time as well and a lot of people believe these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah because the things that they are able to do are very similar to the things that Elijah and Moses did. Call down fire from heaven, the, the plagues and whatnot and things like that. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. So tribulation... The rapture happen, happens, we are gathered with Jesus in the air. He doesn't come yet to rule and reign on this earth. He, we are with him in the sky. So we probably are observing all these things that are happening. And then the trumpet judgment happened and the vials that are poured out on the earth. And that lasts another three and a half years. Now, at the end of God's wrath is when Jesus then comes to set up his millennial reign so what actually ends god's wrath is the marriage supper of the lamb so we all always think of the marriage supper of the lamb as like a supper we're going to sit down with jesus and he's going to serve us and that is partly what it is as well because when jesus sets up his kingdom that's his marriage we're going to be feasting with him and it's going to be a time where now we take over and rule and reign on this earth but not only that, because Jesus comes to rule and reign on this earth, this is when he comes with his armies from the sky. We are now part of those armies coming. And what ends this wrath is Jesus coming and now by force ruling and reigning. And anyone who resists that, is, that's what that last, this battle before the millennial kingdom is going to take place so there are two there are these two epic battles with jesus right one is when he comes down from the sky to establish his millennial reign there is a resistance from the world and that's this fight right here but also at the end of the millennial reign there is another fight right because through the millennial reign there is a resistance that builds up and there is another fight and jesus basically just calls down fire from heaven and just wipes them out his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. That's where we are now. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. 
and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. So you see how this marriage supper is not just us sitting down to eat with Jesus, it's also that there is this great slaughter that happens when Jesus establishes his kingdom, and it's the fowls of the air being invited to feast on you know, the slaughter that happens. So this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So why, is it, why are you blessed to take part in the re first resurrection? Because if you're a believer at the time Jesus comes and you are gathered, then you get your new body and you get to rule and reign with Jesus Christ in that thousand years. But you know what? There are people after Jesus comes that get saved too. Right? And they don't take, get to take part in this. They get saved and they die and they'll be in heaven, but they don't get to take part in that thousand-year reign that's on this earth. Because one thing you might be wondering is, in this thousand-year reign, who are we ruling and reigning over? Have you ever thought of that? Like, who are we ruling and reigning over in this thousand-year period? Because didn't God just wipe out everybody in his wrath? And the answer is no, he didn't. When God pours out his wrath on the earth, yeah, a lot of bad things happen. A lot of people do die. And a lot of people are tormented. But not everybody is killed during that three and a half year period. People survive through God's wrath because they're the people that are resisting when God comes. Right? There are people that, are res that resist and get killed out. But there are people that get saved during this time as well. There are things that are happening and all sorts of things that are happening during this time. And as we go into the millennial reign, who are we ruling and reigning over? People who have not yet received their resurrected body as well as unbelievers. So there are people getting saved during the millennial reign. There are people not getting saved. And through this thousand year period, that's why you wonder, why after a thousand years of Jesus ruling and reigning, at the end of that thousand years, there's another resistance that builds up just after Satan comes out and he's loosed and all that was well, because there are people during the millennial reign that are not happy with Jesus ruling. Just like today, people are not happy with Jesus ruling. And those are the people that fight at that last battle of Armageddon. So then there's a reign of a thousand years on this earth. All right, so Jesus actually comes to this earth the way it is now, and we will rule and reign for a thousand years. It's a, it's a rule where there is a one world government but Jesus is at the top now, not, not the Antichrist. Now, after this thousand-year period, okay, so hopefully you're following along with this timeline. I didn't have time to draw you guys a nice chart. <laughs> but you have the tribulation, remember? Then, it goes, then the tribulation gets really bad, abomination of desolation. Jesus comes, we're re re three and a half years, wrath poured out. Then he comes down, establishes his reign, 1,000-year period. We rule and reign for a thousand years. Now, at the end of this thousand years is the white throne judgment. So the white throne judgment we read in Revelation 20 says here, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose faith the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. So at this white throne judgment now, so to remember that thousand year reign is on this earth that we are on right now. After this thousand year reign, when the white throne judgment happens, this earth, heaven, you know, Jesus says, heaven and earth shall pass away. This is the moment where heaven and earth passes away, right? And everybody is at this white throne judgment. There is no heaven and no earth anymore. There's just a white throne and we're all there, right? Believers and unbelievers. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So this is that judgment where people will be destroyed or they will be 
rewarded, right? Because according to our works, because Jesus has taken our punishment, we're being measured, now rewarded for rewards that we've earned. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So you notice how people are coming out of hell. So remember we started this sermon with, if somebody was to die today, they would be in heaven or in hell. So all this time, as we've talked about the tribulation, the thousand year reign, people in hell have been in hell, but at this time they are momentarily brought out of hell. Right? And this is the reason why even those in hell will say Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father because everyone's begging Jesus for a second chance. Right? So at this right throne judgment, everybody is there, the books are open, everyone is judged. Thankfully for us, we're not judged according to our sins, right? Because Jesus was already judged for us. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Look at this. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So just going back to the fact that not everyone dies in the wrath, we are ruling and reigning over people who don't have their resurrected body. We are ruling and reigning over unbelievers. Notice here it says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So that means that there are people at that white throne judgment that are found in the book of life and are not cast into the lake of fire. Who are they? They are the people that get saved during the thousand year reign and through the wrath and all that stuff. So this is what happens at this white throne judgment. And then people are destroyed. This is the, like the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. I'll skip over this for sake of time. Matthew 10, where Jesus says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So everybody at that point is reunited with their body. Those who take part in the first resurrection already have their glorified body, and those who are unbelievers are thrown into the lake of fire, both soul and body. Romans 14, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So after this place, which is where believers are rewarded and the unbelievers are thrown into the lake of fire, the white throne judgment, then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So this is Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So remember, the thousand year reign happens on this earth. After the thousand years, heaven and earth pass away. There's a white throne judgment where people are doled out their rewards for all eternity and people who have rejected the Lord Jesus are thrown into the lake of fire. After the right throne judgment, then there is the new heaven and new earth. So where, what are we going to be doing for all eternity? Are we going to be just sitting in the clouds in heaven? Some people think, oh, in heaven, it's going to be sitting on a cloud in heaven somewhere. No, no. God makes a new heaven and a new earth. We don't know exactly what that new earth is going to be like. I personally believe it's going to be like the Garden of Eden. Like God's basically going to restore the world to perfect conditions. And what Adam experienced in the Garden of Eden is what we are going to experience, which is a perfect world without pain, without sorrow. But remember, Adam had things to do. Right? So we will have things to do. I, I have a feeling in this new earth, you know, there's going to be commerce. You know, we're going to be building businesses and trading with one another and it's going to be just like how we're living now but if you just imagine a world without pain and sin and sorrow that's what it's going to be like it's going to be a great world and i want to just end on this thought because some people might go and i and i was listening recently to uh, joe rogan podcast with richard dawkins and and you know people get this idea I just wanted to know what you know these people are trying to say, and I just, I just sometimes when I listen to those talks, I just think like, people are just so ignorant of what Christianity actually believes. But one thing they said, like, oh, you know, this is this is one of their their objections to Christianity, which is, well, if you if you got saved and you lived forever in heaven, wouldn't you just get so bored? Like, what would you do? Like, you know, sit on, sit on a cloud playing a harp for all eternity? Like, <laughs> people get that sort of picture. But to just just put this in, just, just think about this for a second, guys. How, how long would it take you to experience every pleasurable thing that this world has to offer? I'm not talking about sinful things. Just think about how many places you could travel, how many places, people you could you meet, how many skills you could learn, 
uh, just things that you, you I mean, you, that you don't even know exist yet. You know how people say, uh, you know, if this is all the knowledge in the universe and you know, like, a speck. I mean, how long would it take you to, to learn everything of all the knowledge in the universe? And you might think, well, well that's, that's not eternity, right? But then what about the things that the universe doesn't even know? So let's say you have all the knowledge in the universe and you're like one speck, how long would it take you? Well then, what about all the things that are outside of that that God knows? That we have, we have even no idea about. We can't even imagine it. But we think someday we're going to be bored in heaven. I mean, who was the creator of pleasure? God was the creator of pleasure. I think he knows how to keep us entertained for all eternity. Right? So I don't think we're going to be sitting in heaven wondering what to do. I think we're going to have plenty of things to do. And the fact that God has already created a world, a temporary world, so vast, who's to say that it can't be changing? I mean, even over, think about it, even over our lifetime, the other side of the world could change. Totally different. Right? So, I mean, it could go on forever, and that's without God's intervention. And that's why the Bible says in Psalm 16, look, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I don't think we're going to get bored on the new heaven and new earth. Anyway, I hope that was a bit interesting for you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for uh, this teaching. There's so much teaching, Lord, and it's just, uh, I'm, I'm glad, Lord, that you revealed so much to us. I mean, we don't need to know all these things, Lord. We don't need to know... Um, all, the, all the stuff that's happening in the future, everything that's happening in the future. But Lord, you've given us this information so that we can have just a taste of the pleasures and the future that you have for those that would just humble themselves and put their faith on you, Lord. And just thank you so much for saving us from our sins. So we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.